It's Joyful Hermit, actually my parents' wedding anniversary, 1941. So that would be about 83 years ago today. They were married in a little home ceremony back in a state in the Midwest in their hometown, which was my hometown, and their parents' hometown. So they um, all were rooted there. And uh, my dad was soon to, he in fact had his military uniform on. He was heading off to war, World War II. So um, anyway, interesting thought I have for them today of their starting out their lives with such hope and yet such horror ahead for the world in the World War II. So thankfully he got back safely and Many men did not, and some women. So, um, but actually, it was April 1st in the Greek church that the hermit Mary of Egypt is celebrated. And she's on the calendar, I think the Roman calendar, on April, 2nd, April 3rd on the Roman martyrology list. Martyrs, although in a way she. I don't know why they considered her a martyr, but um, um, she died for the faith. I guess we all, some of us all, will, but um, that was April 2nd. Anyway, I'm a little bit late because some others, other uh, topics came up in between. But I want to tell you about Mary of Egypt. I think she's significant. I did find a little old paperback on her, or short one. And a lot of it, of course, was word of mouth that was passed down and hagiography, you know, made up or rumors or suppositions. So um, because she was so far back, she was born in 344. And at age 12, she went to um, she left her father's home. She, she grew up in Alexandria, Egypt. She left her father's home and became this wild child, wild young woman. And of course, back then, mar women married sooner. So at age 12, she was a bit young for the wildlife, but she became a prostitute, essentially. And um, she did that for like 12 years. No, 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 17 years. She lived this dissolute life, this wild, immoral life sexually immoral and obviously in other ways and just on her own like a street person like young girls today leave home and get pimped or trafficked or usually find other women that they hang out with and are prostitutes so um i've learned more of that from a, a one of my british mystery detective uh, shows that i watched they have like four seasons, four, not seasons, um, uh, four programs, four, four sections that they'll do a feature or story. <clears throat> and it's fiction, but sometimes it's based on real life too. So, or uh, taken from real life. But it's one of the ways that I oddly sort of stay in touch with the real world out there. And feel more what why women are driven to that it was a true story a true happening that I watched a couple of nights ago it also helps put me to sleep and it eases out tension too because good overcomes in the end but still there's tragedy involved of reality of life somehow it emotionally and mentally helps me cope with my life but also my privileged life of love of God and choices that um, haven't involved for you know anything terrible that has taken my life put my life in danger myself my life has been endangered by others but not not through becoming a prostitute or something, but this latest one was a married woman, even. Times were tight in Great Britain 
was maybe, I don't know, maybe in the 70s or something. Or I think we were going through a terrible recession in the end of the 70s and, or, or into the 80s, early 80s. And, um, but it hit some people very terribly. And this family in Great Britain. So the mother, some man propositioned her when she and her husband were out, offered her five pounds, which was a lot of money then, for sex. She told her husband five minutes and it would be over. And they were in such dire circumstances, their family, that she was determined she was going to do that just a few times until they could get enough money and get, get on their feet again. And the husband didn't want that, but she humbled him, shamed him. You know, well, what else can we do? He was in a just a man, manual or, or a menial worker job and could do no better. Jobs were tight. Well, she ended up, there was a serial killer who targeted prostitutes, and she ended up getting killed. And I don't know the end of it, um, they, I didn't realize they had another more series coming, so I'm going to sign off. I've seen enough to get the idea of what these women go through. Some of them young women, and they were tempted to go to London. One did because she could get paid so much more there to sell her body for sex. Despite their having these billboards, then of three women who were murdered in their area, their small area in more northern England, I guess it was. So Mary, it gives me more um, because they had more details of these women's actual lives for these programs that I get a better idea of the prostitutes. It becomes more real for back in the, um, let's see, she, 344, 3. 56, maybe 360 and in that range, 360 up to um, 369, that she was a prostitute and lived on the streets. So, but she one time, there was a, a relic of the True Cross going to be at a church. I think it was called the Church of the Immaculate Conception or something in uh, Egypt and in where she lived in the in the city and she was drawn she wanted to go in but she was barred they wouldn't let a prostitute street woman in and she looked probably pretty rugged living like that they didn't allow her in and she uh, when they were, you know, pushing her out, she saw this image on a, an image, probably an icon, of the Virgin Mary. And, uh, oh, no, it wasn't the Immaculate Conception back then. <laughs> they didn't have that term for her then. It, but it was some church um, in honor of Mary. So, but there was an image then of Mary, of the Virgin Mary. And she stood before that she was transfixed by Mary, by this image. Would have been an icon, because that's what they did then, the painted icons. And uh, she made a promise, if you'll let me go in, I will give myself. I will do what you ask. So she was allowed in. She walked right in miraculously really and um i mean maybe maybe if we were there we would say well she just sneaked in or they didn't happen to see her or whatever some people come up with to dispel a miraculous occurrence but it was truly between her and mary and mary made way for her to get into that church she knelt down before the relic of the true cross and she heard Mary tell her, pass into Egypt, or pass into Jordan, and thou shalt find rest. And so um, Mary 
Mary of Egypt got up, walked out, and um, handled whatever she needed to handle. She probably had to collect a few possessions, and maybe she was living with someone else, some other women, who knows um, what the circumstances were. But she um, finished up, you know, whatever she needed, and went in, uh, across, the Jord across the river into Jordan. And she, that was the desert. She went out into the desert and stayed there. Well, according to the numbers of her birth and death, it doesn't quite add up. But um, what I was reading then said that for uh, 47 years she was out there. Isolated, she went, was isolated in the desert. The book I read had approximately that long. I don't know if it was 47. Because if she was 17 years a prostitute and 12 years old when she left home, it didn't add up to the age of her death at 77. It's a little bit longer than that. I, I, I don't know why I check these details. But um, I guess curiosity or something or because in life I've learned not to trust everything I read. I, you know, I like accuracy. So, and I'm not afraid of reality and of certain things. Somebody got upset because I had mentioned that um, some think in our time, they think that Catherine of Siena may have d developed in her austerities, in her desire to not eat and to lose interest in eating because she did love God above all else. But asceticism in her time was a, pra a practice of severe practice. She lived maybe not quite a hundred years before St. Francis of Paula. So she um, took the discipline, she wore a cincture, she isolated herself in a in her room at her home and didn't come out for months, stopped eating and um, or bit by bit did and then totally stopped eating. And she lived on the Eucharist, but she was very ill all the time then and, and thin and she died at age 33. And some do feel that she, through that uh, discipline of of not eating, of eating less and less, and then not eating at all, that it was a form of anorexia, That which I could see that could happen from um, austerity. But her purpose was love of God for doing it, was because that was an acceptable practice then for those who were uh, wanted to come to God, an ascetic. And, and did anything for the love of God. And lost, she lost interest in eating and lost, and she died to herself and inflicted, she wanted to feel the pains of Christ. So inflicted the discipline, which was usually beating themselves with <clears throat> cords and sometimes um, metal chunks would be attached to the ends of the cords like a whip and whip their bare backs and things, or even their legs and their bodies. So, <clears throat> um, and I did that. I, I used a belt with a buckle end just to experience that. Not long. Um, it was in my austerity phase, and um, I don't know, maybe we go through a phase when we are so desiring God that we we read these things and we have this yearning to come close to him no matter what it takes so and i read about saint ignatius of loyola who whipped himself to practically he nearly died well i wasn't going to do that but i guess i wanted to experience what these saints did and i didn't bring blood or anything i might have had some scratches or whatever but um it was an, it, it was a an experience of detachment of doing something such as when I gave away possessions and wore the austere outfit um, 
It was an experience of I can detach from the temporal. I don't need these things. I don't need to be approved by others. I don't need to protect my body or or not take more pain. But see, that's when my spiritual father said, because I told him, you know, but, and he says, well, go ahead and try it, you know, if you want to, you know, experience it and all. He was very wise. And um, then he said, you have so much suffering that God gives you. He says, understand, you know, that you don't need to do these things. God will bring what he wants to you. He says, look at your life in all the other ways. Um, even then, two of my children were on the fritz with me. And, and um, you know, it was that was awful. They were still fairly young and, and no explanation, really. Well, I knew my son was angry about Catholicism, but that that might have been, no, he had graduated then, but barely, but I knew he had gotten attached to his dad then. I didn't realize it continued on but over the years, but um, it was all, it was a lot of pain, a lot of like, how on earth could this happen? When he knew about his dad, he was a big part of the reason we had to flee California. That his sisters and he, you know, they weren't going to visit anymore, which was threw us into the child protective services and the, all this investigation and and put me on the hot spot that I somehow was was planting these things in them, which I wasn't. I couldn't have made up what my ex husband was doing to the boy when he was six with in the, my wildest imagination that he would be so warped, my ex-husband would, and so perversely controlling that he would do things to him in the bathroom or in the shower that were control issues, but molestation, not rape, but what he did was a power of I'm a man over you. And my son was terrified and evidently screaming and his sisters came home and said and cried and says we're not going back because of what he's doing to to our brother, our little brother. And they told me I was horrified. I asked him. He cried and said, "Yes, mommy. You know he did these things and what did he? Well, he did this to me in the shower and I don't like it. And I told him to stop and he won't. And um, you know it just." My life, it, it, well, it just keeps going on anyway. But it, And my spiritual dog was right. And I'm telling you, God will provide for you too. He, he gives us what we need of austerities and sufferings and sorrows that we must overcome of, of pains. We don't need to be, and those modes have gone out, but some things like the externals, such as testing ourselves to see if we really can detach. Are we really detached? Well, find something that means a lot to you and give it to someone. You know, give it to a loved one, give it to a grandchild or a, a, and a child or a, a relative if it's something in the family, some piece of jewelry or, or, if someone needs something and you're strapped, like God made it clear to me, he wanted me to take more of mine, what I had left, and get Father Vincent this car. And then he needed even more money. But in a way it turned out well, because I had no more money than to hire the handyman. And that put an end to that, because he's gotten angry. He's paranoid and thinking that I'm, you know, other ulterior motives or something. No, I don't have the money. So I'm scraping, I'm scraping to get together for taxes and for things I owe for the Home Depot promotions that are coming due. But I mean, I, I <laughs> by the grace of God, I got a letter and I found an account, some 
mutual fund or something my parents had had that I had inherited. And um, so there's that. And yes, I have to pay a big penalty to withdraw, but thank God it's there and it's going to cover my costs that I have coming up. So go in faith and God will provide. And Mary of Egypt did that. When she heard this voice in her locution, the voice of Mary is a woman's voice. Tell her, pass into Jordan, and thou shalt find rest. So where she ended up was in the desert. And she went out by herself, which took tremendous detachment and courage. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit guided her all the way. This is little Mercy here wanting some attention. I'm reaching out to rub her under her chin, which she likes. Um, and so she was there alone. And in the book I read, it was that, um, when she was finally seen by a man, they say Zosimus and they call him Abbot Zosimus, but I researched and there's an Abbot Zosimus, but he was two centuries later. So can't be the right one unless he was, he was a, a vision came in vision. Um, you know, came from beyond. Or there was a different, a Zos, there were other Zosimus in the, um, when I researched. And he might have been one of these others, but there was only one Abbot Zosimus that I came around. But anyway, um, it was a Zosimus who uh, gave her communion, found her in the distant, out far in the desert. And he didn't even recognize her as a, practically as a person, definitely not as a woman. First, he thought she was like a pillar, a pillar of, of like sandstone in the desert or stone because her hair had grown down. She was naked and her hair had grown down to her feet and was, she was filthy and, and wizened and wrinkled and um, the, the desert air had dried her, practically fossilized her, but she was alive and upright. And he, so he gave her communion. He, um, found out, you know, asked who she was and she, because, uh, people had heard rumor for all those years had, uh, a rumor had started story back into Alexandria and among the desert dwellers that there was a woman named Mary who was out there by herself, a hermit, an extreme one, who um, no one had seen in, in decades, in, in years, 30 or 40 years. And so this man was determined to find her, locate her, and he finally did. She had been living out in some cave and um, wandering also and survived on barely anything. She was very thin and sur had survived on whatever she could get. I'm sure she must have encountered someone now and then, maybe to get food, or she just ate from oases, maybe some dates or... Um, somebody gave her some bread if she encountered some stranger. But in the end, that's how she appeared to this Zosimus. And he wrote of it and of how he couldn't, didn't even recognize her at first as a human being. And definitely not as a woman because she was covered. This hair grew down. And um, so he said he would come back in one year's time one year's time, and he did and found her deceased. So the, the time, though, the date, I believe it was April 1st that she was, uh, that her body was found. And it was a year, about a year from the time that he had given her Eucharist. And the, her cult grew of this Mary of Egypt an unusual figure, someone who had been a derelict, an immoral sinner, the worst of sinners, and 
had this conversion with the Virgin Mary. Listen to what the Virgin, and through the true cross. She had knelt before the true cross, and that's when she heard Mary tell her, go out into the desert, go, cross over to Jordan, and thou shalt find rest. And that's the message for all of us. Go to God. Um, get away from... We can be in the middle of a city and still get away from the material, temporal world. We can be alone in a room like I am and get away from myself, from my own ego, from my own dogs, from my own concerns and attachments to pain. I'm attached to pain. That's not by my choosing, but it is a consideration. It's part of what I have to deal with in my material life. And I had a, a, mar a rough day yesterday, not extreme, but still was in, you know, that injection hadn't worked for all, so I had to take more things, and I didn't eat. I drank some stewed prunes that I whipped, you know, beat to make them liquefied. <laughs> and... uh lots of tea, and uh, then finally in the evening, I, I baked, baked some vegetables with olive oil and herbs, and that seemed to help the warmth and of that on my gut, in my gut, and the olive oil, I think, helped. So uh, still today, marginal, but better, have to run a, a temporal errand but even while we're driving in the truck, the dogs love to go. Gives them a chance to get out and watch and see. And they stay in the truck when I go in. I've got to do some returns and pick up some things. And they love to people watch. So it's fun for them. At least it's a little something. We've had terrible weather here. They haven't been able to go to the dog park. And rain has been so heavy. We're supposed to even have snow today that they, you know, we're, they're not wanting to stay out long at all. They go out and do their business and come right back in with me. But um, we can get away from any of this by going to God within and having our love of God. And that's, that's what Catherine of Siena wanted. She yearned for that. She undoubtedly read Lives of the Saints. They did. Teresa of Avila knew of them. Teresa and her brother, when they were little children, had heard all about the Crusades. And they left home when they were just maybe five and seven or four and six and and left and even went outside the wall of that went around Avila and, and were going to try to find the Holy Land. They were going to go and help with the Crusades, fight in the Crusades, these little children. So... You know, we're in, and an uncle, or maybe it's an older brother, maybe it's an uncle, probably an uncle, I think it was, who went out looking for them then when it started to get dark and they couldn't be found and found them out, you know, wandering, heading out. <laughs> um, and probably quite happy to see their uncle and to be brought back home at that point. Realized the big world isn't, isn't, wasn't quite for them yet. But um, Teresa tried, you know, she, she tried things, but she found practicality and reason, which is what I did, thanks to my spiritual father t explaining to me, too. You know, these things, God will do with you what he wills. You don't have to make up things to, you know. Um, we do have to... to, to do our own detaching from temporal things. That's a practice that we should practice. That's a, a, an action that at least a test to see, can I really do this? And then we'll feel the pang of, you know, it's sort of a, it's a strange sensation when you give away uh, all your things or give away things that you, that, that had meaning and you enjoyed or give up certain things of your life, um, but it's a good it's a good experience, and um, 
but extremism isn't helpful. But anyway, that was um, Mary of Egypt, and she she left her dissolute life, and just the fact that she lived a life like that was a detachment. Um, not a holy one, but when she went out into the desert, that was. She was listening to the voice of the Virgin Mary. And Jesus would have been the one to, and the Holy Spirit who spoke to her and who um, gave her that urging to go in to even kneel before the, the portion of the true cross <clears throat> in that church or even for her to want to go in. So uh, God touched her, and her life out in the desert was austere, obviously. But she was doing reparation for her dissolute life as a prostitute for 17 years as a young woman. And she became one with God, and that's how God called her to that life, and it was more of something that went on in those time periods. But we have our ways now in our time period. Um, mine is going on 40 years of not being in a relationship. Um, and then after my children left home, that's been since the youngest left, that was 2002, he left 22 years. Um, it's it becomes a way of life it's what we're called to and if God didn't have something else for us he didn't for me and God and God made it clear that I was to be his spouse and um, I had to learn that though I had to learn and I had to give up I was put through tests and had to let go. So, And then um, make reparation, though, for things that I did that were wrong, for not immediately obeying God and listening to his. And he will give you more chances then when you're repentant. I, I felt terrible. I thought I knew I'd been tricked by the devil, tricked, and I fell for it. And there are consequences for that. So I've had some consequences. I probably won't have the um, gifts, some of the, the spiritual gifts that I might have had before. There are consequences. But I'm okay with that. I, I, it's whatever God wants. That's the point we get to. That's why someone like Mary of Egypt is really important for us to consider <clears throat> to consider her life <clears throat> not just from the standpoint of her sinfulness her choosing that life and leaving home maybe some argument maybe she you know loved some young man and her parents said no not yet or or we don't approve of him to, for you to marry we'll arrange the marriage maybe and she got angry and left. Who knows? Um, we're human. Probably no, not much different than why young women or men run off today, leave home over some argument or disturbance or upset that they have, that they're not getting what they want. Or sometimes because they're being abused at home and feel they have no other place to go but out the streets would be better than being here or stay with a friend and then have to leave there or whatever happens to them. So, but then when there's conversion, when there's conversion, then, then really life and the world opens up to us. And that conversion goes on and on and on. Repeated conversions. Teresa of Avila spoke of her second conversion. Her first one when she was young and then her second one in her later 40s when she realized that she wasn't living the religious life to the degree that she wanted to. 
and signed up for even. So she had this big second conversion. And that's what began the reform of the entire Carmelite order from her conversion. But most of us will have many, many conversions. And I feel that I'm in one. I don't even know what number it is. But it's from this, when I was sure that I would be dead by November, Christmas at the latest, and that my tests were showing this, this big M spike in one of the, in the platelets, and which indicated a, a blood cancer that was acute. And but lo and behold, it when I when the all the other tests they did a final test that was conclusive, no multiple myeloma. No, that was the M spike part. No acute, um, some type of leukemia. Um, the M spike ended up being what's called an M gus, which is a, a false or preliminary reading. So I'll be checked every year. I have a predisposition for this cancer, this certain type of cancer. Well, my dad had a Waldenstrom's disease. Um, I forget, hypoglycemia, something. Something to do with his, his blood. His blood was thick, and he had to have injections to thin it. Um, and eventually he would die from it, but they were so focused on that, he ended up dying of his prostate got out of control. Prostate cancer, because they were so focused. His doctors evidently were on the Waldenstrom's, which was increasing, was getting worse. But it hadn't, wouldn't have killed him yet. But we all have a, a way that we're going to go and a time that we're going to go. But I'm, I'm, a lot, I'm not going to die right now unless God has some surprise for me. So I realized that I wasn't living my life as God wanted. And, um, and the shock that Jesus wasn't coming for me right now. It's taken a while to get over that. I was so long, just this morning, as I was walking back here with my St. Joseph mug, something hot liquid for my gut, I, um, I just had this flash of how I had so looked forward to seeing my spiritual dog again. Thought of my parents on their anniversary, their temporal anniversary today, wedding anniversary, you know that, and and just this wave of, of, nostalgia came over me, but no, I'm having a deeper conversion, and I've noticed I've stopped losing interest in these, even the British shows at night. Even though I'm tired and can't sleep, and I, their, even their accents put me to sleep, but I'm losing interest in that, and I know that that's God working on me. To um, God does with us what, what he will. So I'll be back to more reading, and, or just laying here at night pondering. Pondering, that's all existing and pondering, which is what God wants of me, I'm pretty sure, or I wouldn't have this detachment going on, this automatic innate thing where they, they just, I, I have enough reminders now of what it's like in our time with any number of horrible problems people have. And it isn't just the, the the criminal aspects of mysteries, but it's um, some of these programs get into relationships and families and um, careers. Think all, uh, the whole gamut of the human experience and the trials that people have, including spiritual trials and moral moral decision issues and attachments, attachments to temporal 
not just attachments to drugs or alcohol, but attachments to things, to food. Oh, they have people people in these programs that are have eating problems. You know, they're just they're not reality shows, but they're they're based on, and that's why they're watched. Um, but the ones that I like that help me most are the ones that the good, the good guys overcome the evil. And there's always some dilemma that is overcome and I feel just the tension leave my body. <laughs> and because pain can create a lot of tension, uh, even energy, pain, pain has a lot of energy to it. So then I can finally fall asleep. So, um, but I figured that was sort of a good use of someone who's really, God has evolved my hermit life. This is more what he wanted back in 2007 when I had wandered out and had been trying to do good things in parishes. Started a Catholic book discussion. Well, God, there was one person who came, but that person was a critical person. It's the one who struggles with the inherited mental illness and needed a friend, and we're still friends. And uh, we've become spiritual friends. I got on her case and her husband's case about they lived close to the period. Why aren't you going to daily mass? <laughs> I could be horrible. And, you know, talked to them about it and got them interested in books and in the spiritual life. And while well, I then dribbled off again on the island, you know, where I was doing all this manual labor and just trying to survive, um, um, the the woman she the husband became very active. He's he's sacristan. I think he's Eucharistic minister also, and he he altar serves when the bishop comes there or for the priest when they don't have the younger servers like for daily mass, and he uh, does a lot of art. He makes the Easter candle. The he's an artist, so he does that, and very involved in the parish now. They have the priests over to discuss uh, things of the, you know, for the, the Easter vigil or for the candle, what they want. And and they, uh, and she has become practically like a hermit. She's married, their adult son lives there. He works, but um, he's there at home with them and at night. And um, she, she has like an orarium because she's very routinized from the medication she's on. So she she's in the house, she reads, she does some, usually bakes some a box mix bread. They go to the grocery. She likes to go to the grocery like every day. They they enjoy they enjoy different things, foods, unusual fruit, or they'll try something different. And the husband is also he's very good with her trying to keep her balanced so that she won't fixate on anything or obsess over something um, and to keep watch to make sure her medications are working and all. She's very bright. He's very bright. They're both very talented people. She, and she daily EWTN programs in mass. She reads um, devotional books. She reads scripture, the daily scripture we do, the daily mass readings. And then at about 8.30 every night, my 10.30 her time, she will um, write what she did that day and then uh, chooses a scripture that, that then I can write back and talk about or write about and from the, from the mass readings. And um, she prays for my family and... I pray for her. So it's a spiritual friendship. And it's one that, that I think really the only one that that uh, outside of her family that I have my handicap, but it's not anything like hers. So she does have another friend who is disabled and I think maybe born a slower, slow-minded 
woman that lives alone and she and her husband sort of look after the woman if she gets sick or and we'll take her the Sunday bulletin she goes to to the church once a week and and that's um, she's living practically a hermit life in a way or a, a like a religious a lay religious person um, more so than many third order people would live and it's just wonderful for me to see that has given her purpose purpose and function and meaning and she's taken up knitting and crochet and is making beautiful things and she used to feel like uh, her husband was more in love with his art than her and I pointed out to her recently that she's an art she's a, a textile artist and uh, of the textile arts uh, um, fiber art I said and she is. She says, well, no, that's more, I'm just a craft, craft, it's just craft. And I explained the difference between crafts and fiber art. She puts a lot into it, even in the choice of the yarns and gifts people then with what she makes. And so um, I think that helped her to realize she's an artist also. She didn't realize she is. And um, of a, of the practical arts, functional arts. And he's of the, I guess you would call fine arts or the ascetic arts or something like that. Yeah, so um, anyway, um, we, we are all sinners. We have our conversion. She and her husband, in essence, had a deeper conversion. They, they changed their lives from sort of floundering in, uh, he was so frustrated with life and how ill his wife was. It's not easy living with a paranoid schizophrenic. And it was severe. She ended up having to have shock treatments, which is not done often, but that's what it took to get it under control. And then these strong medications. And... Um, but she's, and he helps her and, and knows the, the balance that she needs. And um, he has friends who come, they art friends, men and their wives or their partners will come and spend a couple of nights and her sister and brother-in-law or his brother and a wife will come. So they, and then they go to things at the church if there's a Bible study or they're the Lenten, they had Lenten uh, once a week on the virtues. The priest would talk about a virtue once a week. and So their lives now are centered around church and God. And what a difference it's made for both of them. They've had this big conversion. Well, I'm in a conversion. And I'm, that's what Mary of Egypt is helping me understand. And that helps me to work with it more and to let go more and to not uh, get so uh, involved in concern about how on earth, how on, on this earth am I going to handle finishing this place myself? And when, I have to put out of mind when. I was ready to paint two days ago, prime and paint then by today I would have had the cabinets in and been able to call the countertop people who've been so patient. But no, God had different for me. It's his timing. So I had that horrible, unexpected abdominal attack. And it's, it's not just constipation. It's my, my intestines aren't moving. They're the mo I have motility problem, and they're per they're paralyzing, so I have to live with that. Yesterday I had to live with it. I managed to pick up supplies from Home Depot with the dogs, and um, then I was ill again. So 
Today, I'll run some errands. I'm hoping to prime a wall, sand and prime. <laughs> we just keep going. And we, we learn to detach from our own concerns. And we do penance if needed. God will provide the penance. But deeper conversions go out into the desert, pass over into Jordan, and thou shalt find rest. What is Jordan? What is the desert? Let's think on this today and leave your comments, if you would, if you are so inclined. Um, how do we find rest also? Where do we pass over in our own individual lives? Where are we? Where is God? Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is Jesus? Where is even Mary? Where are they telling us to pass over to find rest? What do we need to repent of? What is our deeper conversion, our, our third, fourth, fifth, eighth, tenth, a hundredth conversion that God would like of us? And then how can we cooperate with that? But there was Mary, and she was found. A year later, he was going to bring communion back, and she was dead. And he buried her out there, as Osimus did. Um, I have found great help from Mary of Egypt when I realized God wanted me to let go of being in a parish and of, of physically, temporally being at Mass. And receive, I, I didn't receive Eucharist, but I, I did mystically. And it became superfluous. I had already received in the mystical state, in the ecstasy. So I remember one time the bishop wanted to give me communion, and some women, even at the parish here, um, first checked, you know, wanted to make sure I was Catholic, which was fine probably what they needed to do, I guess. And and they were concerned still when I said, yes, I was, but the Holy Spirit let them trust me, and they got a host, asked the priest, and it was after Mass. They must have seen me back there and were wondering. And I think the one of them suspected something spiritual. That's why they asked. Um, and I wasn't dressed, you know, I was dressed well, decently, so um, probably had some makeup on even, so I looked okay. Not, not strange. <laughs> so um, they brought me communion, but I, I felt sort of guilty. It was like, it's like if you're already full, crammed full with the best food ever, superior food, and someone is trying to stuff another big chunk of bread in your mouth. You know, it was... I don't mean to be disrespectful at all. Understand, I had already been fed in the in the ecstasy, subsumed into God. I had been filled, filled with God, and um, so nothing else was needed. And then I did start remembering Mary of Egypt as one of the persons. I thought, well, these. These hermits didn't go to didn't go into a parish, um, and rarely they say they would go to mass once a week. If somebody was a priest that came out, they would have mass and worship once a week, if they were in walking distance to get there. But the bulk of the desert fathers and mothers never had Eucharist, and never had mass. They had Eucharist from Christ. They had mystical communion. They grew close to Christ and were fed by Christ in a way that most of us don't understand. Um, but we, we have, got, Jesus gave us communion for the bulk of us and um, for the tangible host and tangible blood that is his body and his blood. It's been transubstantiated. During, it's been consecrated. 
So it's holy and it feeds us and keeps us going. I used to not be able to go a day. I mean, somebody would bring it to me because it so fed me and helped me endure my suffering. The PT uh, yesterday morning asked his voice, it's amazing you're still Catholic with what all's happened to you. I said I would never be anything other. I said, you, you don't understand. <laughs> He's married to, he was married to a Catholic woman. So he has two children, and so he's very familiar. But um, I said I would never be anything else. There's, uh, he says, well, he says they are, they're the lead in any theology and thinking. And I said, oh yes, yes, all of that, for all these centuries, and that's why the media attacks them the most. They're the biggest threat in the world. To liberal to, to the liberal movement and to the sexual revolution and to all these other aspects to to uh, materialism they're the biggest threat and um, even within the church the division going on but um, the Eucharist alone the mass compared to a Protestant service. There's no comparison. Um, it's just night and day. And I was so subsumed into the Mass that it's as, oh, for those times that I went, those years, that I was there in ecstasy. And in Mass, but in God at the same time, in this supernatural way that it's like the mass is in me. It's, I became, I became one with the mass. That's how I can explain it. And to watch it online is superfluous, but the scripture readings and um, if that hadn't happened to me I would be at daily mass even if I was crawling in there I would be I would go unless I was in an extreme pain siege and then I would grieve that I couldn't be at mass so um, and I would go two times a day at least you know I loved hearing the different sermons I loved Mass so much, if they let me go three times, I would have. Because there would be evening Masses at other parishes. At the Cathedral Chapel had morning Mass and noon Mass. Those are the ones I would go. It, um, so, but God has been having deeper conversions, and in my particular life, since he evolved me and has me as a hermit and held me finally understand that I'm not going to fit in. I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually a burr to a parish. Uh, I rub against and it, it isn't good. And um, it's not my world. And Mary of Egypt is, is a main person for me to touch base with, to understand, and to realize I'm okay this way. This is okay. She was with God in ways beyond the temporal, as were the other desert fathers and mothers. But she just stands out to me in particular. Um because of her her life and how it transpired and how how solitary she was i'm not nearly that i can't be i have to get my pump refilled next week to run an errand today but i am in the process as soon as i can get this done which i have to be careful not to be over eager because i can only go so fast but i'm going to radically simplify radically 
And uh, I just have to have energy even to do that. So to get myself out of what, what I thought was a prudent way of earning some money, some income, to pay for my end-of-life care, which I will need because I don't have people wanting me to, to wanting to take me in. So, uh, but this one daughter is willing to stay here um, when it gets to the point where I'm nearly gone, and then the house will roll over into her name. She'll she'll be able to have this because she can't. She can't get one, not much of anything. Interest rates are so high, and she went through a divorce, so she's, um, and I don't understand. I think her husband made some bad investments, but that they didn't have more money than they did for his income and everything, so um, that's how life can be. We go with the flow. Go with God's flow. God bless his real presence in us, and Thanks to someone like Mary of Egypt, who we have her life story and we have her now. Reach out to her today. Ask her to help you in any way you need with deeper conversion, listening to locutions that we might be getting, and in doing. And think through and leave comments. What is your passing over into Jordan? Would that, would that message relate with you? It does to me, but I'm not quite sure what I'm to do there. Totally, you know, there's more. There's more specific that I know God will tell me, or Mary of Egypt might tell me. I'm going to ask her. In faith, you will find out.